Hi everybody, I'm Greg Fischel and welcome to bonus weather video number one for this week. And we're going to talk today about how does air move up and down? And that's pretty critical for meteorologists to diagnose because where the air is going up, if there's enough moisture, you get the formation of clouds and precipitation and where it's going down, you tend to get warming and drying and the clouds go bye-bye. So these are things that we try to diagnose and forecast every day. All right, so let's take a look at the three elements that combine to give us an idea as to where those areas are going to be. First of all, the wind. Number two, the spin in the atmosphere. And number three, the amount of temperature contrast. So a little review here, first of all. Vorticity, which we've talked about before, it's a fancy word for spin or a measure of local rotation in a fluid. And the air is considered in the scientific community to be a fluid. Component number one of vorticity is curved flow. If the isobars are curved, the flow is going to be curved along with it. And component number two, horizontal wind shear. All right, so let's take a look at the first component here, the curved flow. If we have an isobar, then the air is basically, with a few minor exceptions, going to blow along those isobars and eventually end up on the right-hand part of the screen there, okay? Now, the vorticity maximum is going to be where the flow is curved the greatest with the point of rotation to the north. So think of the old protractor you used back in grade school, all right? If the point of rotation is to the north and then the bottom of it is going to swing back and forth like that, that's where you're going to have the vorticity maximum. And then the vorticity minimum will be where the curvature is the greatest with the point of rotation to the south, okay? All right. Now, we also have the horizontal wind shear component to all of this. Think of a jet stream blowing from west to east with the strongest winds in the middle, and then the winds drop off both to the north and to the south. If we impose a couple of circular objects within that flow, then the one to the north starts to turn in a counterclockwise manner, and the one to the south in a clockwise manner. So just the, vertical, or the horizontal wind shear is generating positive vorticity to the north of the jet stream and negative vorticity to the south. All right, so how does all this come into play with generating upward motion? Well, let's take a situation in the upper atmosphere. And for those of you that are weather hobbyists, you know that this would be referred to as a trough, and this is a ridge out in here. OK, so the maximum vorticity, again, is going to be right where that trough axis is with the point of rotation to the north, OK? And so if you look at this carefully, the flow pattern is trying to advect or move higher levels of vorticity along in the flow. So we call that positive vorticity advection, and that tends to lead to rising motion in the atmosphere. On the west side of that trough axis, the flow is trying to advect or move lower levels of vorticity uh, along in the flow. We call that negative vorticity advection, and that tends to lead to sinking motion. So this is the vorticity element component to whether or not the air is going to be going up or down. Now, let's take a look at the temperature contrast component. Okay, so this time the dotted lines are going to be isobars, okay? And we're going to impose a temperature field on that. And the red lines are what we call isotherms, which are lines of equal temperature. Iso equal therm referring to temperature. And I've just arbitrarily chosen five values, 55 on up to 75 in uh, intervals of five. So we have the counterclockwise circulation around the area of low pressure. And so what does that result in? Well, we've got the counterclockwise flow, but now because of that, we've got the isotherms that have been distorted. They've been moved to the north, to the east of the circulation, and to the south, uh, to the west of the circulation, okay? Circulation center. And so we call the first one warm advection, where, again, higher temperatures are being advected or moved along in the flow and distorting the isotherms, and the warm advection tends to lead to rising motion. To the west of the center of low pressure, you have cold advection. Colder temperatures are being advected along or moved along in the flow, and that tends to result in sinking motion in the atmosphere. Now, sometimes you have situations where these two cancel each other. Like you can have strong positive vorticity advection, which you would think would make the air go up, but then in that same location, you can have a strong cold advection, which counteracts it and just wipes it out, okay? 
And for snow lovers, that happens a lot. Sometimes we have these big troughs in the upper atmosphere and you think, oh boy, it's gonna snow. But the problem is we've got serious cold advection going on and so it basically wipes out uh, that upward motion. But when you add the two in concert, uh, then you can uh, end up getting the air going up pretty violently and those are the uh, situations that lead to our biggest precipitation events. All right, I hope that makes a little bit of sense. I uh, hope you enjoyed that. It took me a, uh, ages to create these graphics. I'm still learning. I'm still learning, I swear. All right, so that's it for today. We'll have another daily weather update for you tomorrow. Another bonus weather video coming up on Friday. Happy Tuesday evening, everybody. We'll talk to you soon.